in him and him alone. How many of you this morning can say the Lord has brought you a long, long way? Is there anybody this morning you've been through some things you didn't think you'd make it through? How many of you have been through some physical stuff you didn't know if you were going to make it through? How about some financial stuff? You say, I didn't know if I'd make it through, but the Lord made a way. Is there anybody here ever got some news that just totally rocked your world and you thought, what am I going to do now? But God brought you through. I'm going to tell you this morning, we're serving a mighty God, a powerful Savior, one that's able to bring us through no matter what we face. And I'm so thankful this morning for his goodness and mercy. Daniel chapter number 3. We're going to read from a very familiar story. Uh, Daniel, and we read this story about the three Hebrew boys. They have become famous, if you will, in the household of faith because of their stand in the Lord. But this is where the Lord took me to this morning. And I'd like to be able to just reach over somewhere in the Bible and preach something you've never heard of. And maybe you just blow your mind. But you see, the most important thing that a man of God can do is mind the Lord, what he wants, the message of the hour. And so that's what I'm going to do today. So Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 15, good to see our good friends coming in this morning. Just make yourself right at home. You know, we're no, we're no highfalutin, we say, down in the south people. We're just down to earth. You just come right in here and make yourself at home. One of these days we're going to get to go on the other side, and we're going to all worship together anyhow there. So the Bible says here, Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 15, if you have it, say amen. Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the coronet, flute, heart, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. So there was a whole lot more than just those few instruments. You fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. I'm glad they were all in one accord, aren't you? But they all answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Listen to verse 18. But if not, I want you to say these few words with me. Be it known unto thee. Say that again. Be it known unto thee. Say it one more time. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should be, should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. In other words, seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. Most of you know the story. The people that actually got in a scurry and a hurry to try to gather them together ended up getting burnt from the heat and, and dying because of trying to be, put them in the fire. And uh, I'll tell you what, it must have been an incredibly hot fire. We just stretch a hand to the Lord this morning and pray for God's perfect will in this service. Father, this morning, as we come before you, we realize, God, our great need for such a great God. Lord, all of our efforts can be so futile, and we know this morning that without you, we're absolutely nothing. But with you, we are great, and we're mighty, we're an army, we're your bride. And I pray that you'll smile down upon your bride this morning. Give us the word of God. I pray that you'll help me as a minister to declare it exactly the way you would have me to say it. And I'll give you praise for everything you do, and everyone can say it. Amen. Say this with me one more time. Be it known unto thee. 
be it known unto thee. As you're being seated this morning, thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. So thankful for God's presence and his will. Whatever you change, Brother Justin, change it back. I feel like this morning something's changed. Praise God. I want you to take a look this morning at the Word of God and its and in its entirety, everything that God has shown us in the past, and then taking a fresh look at it this morning for what God would say to us in this hour. You and I, most all of us know that it's pretty obvious that there's a great and a continuous war that is going on, a war that we cannot see with human eyes. It is a spiritual battle or warfare that is not seen with human eyes, but it is going on all the time. It's a war between good and evil, a war between heaven and hell that is going on at all times. This war between the forces of good and evil that goes on all the time was going on during the days that Nebuchadnezzar came against this, the three Hebrew boys. If you were to look back and you, you take a look at verse number uh, two, I believe it is, I was glancing through this. I want you to see what the Lord showed me here, and I want you to see the picture that was painted in the Word of God. The Bible said that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, the rulers of all the princes, provinces to come to this dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. That's a whole lot of people. What he was trying to do, he was trying to get everybody there. They had spent time building and erecting this great, I believe uh, my study in the past said it was about a 90-something foot God that they spent all of this time building and now this coronation day has come and, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar wants everybody to bow down to this great image that has been erected in front of the whole community. And so he has called on everybody to be there. And so when we pick this in our mind. I, I want us to be able to see exactly the way that it most likely was. If you've ever been or you've seen on television or something, a great stadium with literally thousands upon thousands of people gathered all around and down at the bottom of the stadium there, there's often something going on, whether it's a football game or soccer game or some sort of thing. All of the attention is on whatever is going on, whether it's a president and his commencement speech uh, and you've got thousands upon thousands of people that are standing everywhere and they're watching what is taking place. This is what has taken place on this particular day. And now with thousands of people, rulers, sheriffs, uh, people from all over the province, thousands of people gathered everywhere, we've got our attention all focused on three Hebrew boys and what they are going to do. Everybody else is willing to bow down. Everybody else has got no problem, but somebody has raised the the possibility that these three Hebrew boys, they're not going to bow down. They refuse to be a part of your system, Nebuchadnezzar. And you understand that Nebuchadnezzar goes to them and and he, he gives them an opportunity and he comes in a convincing way to them. And when we read in verse number 15, the Bible shows us that he gives them a choice And he makes sure that as he gives them this choice, he explains the dire consequences of them trying to follow their faith. Listen to what he said in verse 15. He said, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the coronet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast into that same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands Uh, now he's giving them a choice it's up to you what you want to do but this is what it's going to be you're either going to worship this image or we're going to cast you into the fire and who is that God that's going to be able to have the ability the authority or the power to get you out of this situation and so it's done in such a convincing and a uh, 
per, uh, uh, persuading way, if you will. He wants to convince these three Hebrew boys uh, that there is no other way. This is the only choice you have uh, to do this. And I want you to know the devil does the same thing today. He wants to convince you that there is no other route. There is no other way but to go this particular way. He wanted to challenge their faith. Amen. If you follow your faith and you do what God has put in your heart to do, this will be your demise. Uh, Amen. It's kind of like if I put it in everyday realistic terms, uh, the doctors come along and the doctor said, you may die because of this one particular disease. Uh, And uh, so you tell the doctor, well, I'm going to trust the Lord. Uh, And the doctor says, well, if you don't take this treatment or take this medicine, you're going to die. And then you're faced with a dilemma. Do I trust my faith? Do I put my faith in what I feel God's shown me? Or do I go this route? I want you to know we've all been in dilemmas in our life as to whether or not we're going to trust God or we're going to trust the flesh or the arm of the flesh. We've all been in that situation. We may not have been before thousands of people, but I want you to know the decision that we make, I believe, will affect and impact a lot of different people around us. You see, here is the problem. There are countless thousands, possibly, of people that are going to watch the decision that he makes. These three Hebrew boys, they were looked at as people of faith. And if they crumble under the pressure, imagine all the other potential possibilities of other people that may watch on and say, well, if the three Hebrew boys, if they didn't trust God enough, then how can we? Hey, man, can you see where I'm going? Hey, man, how can your children, who you pray God save them, how can your family, how can your co-workers, how can everybody else have faith in your God if you don't have faith in your God? What you do on that job site, the way you talk, the way you act, it'll have a resounding effect on a lot of other people. You got to make up your mind whether you're going to go all the way and serve the Lord or you're going to stop part way. But I made up my mind, Lord, if I can but have a testimony quite like and under the three Hebrew boys, listen, they were facing death. Now we can say a lot of things, but whenever you're facing somebody taking your literal flesh body and putting it in a literal burning fire, amen, put it in perspective, think about that. In front of thousands of people, all you've got to do is bow down and worship this silly image and then you're, then it's over with and you don't have to go in the fire. Do you know the devil would like you to believe that, well, you just pray about it later. Just, just, just bow down, worship, and just pray about it later and it'll be all right. But you're wavering in your faith. It not only affects your relationship between you and God, but it also affects the relationship of everybody that's watching you. Can you say man? You see, I believe with all of my heart uh, that the enemy wants to in every way possible. He loves to even do this even the more so in my opinion to people that are leaders, uh, people that got high influence. Uh, If he can get a mama whose grandchildren or children have watched her faith walk just crumble under the pressure just a little bit, he's going to turn up the heat. Uh, He's going to get it hotter than it's ever been. Uh, He's going to send a trial by and he's going to tempt you to just throw in the towel and throw up your hands and absolutely quit. But what would it be like if that same grandmother, that same grandfather, that same praying church said we realize and acknowledge that things are bad. You know, just having faith doesn't mean that you don't realize what you're up against. It doesn't mean that you got to ignore the symptom. It doesn't mean that you got to ignore how bad things really are because honey things are bad they're bad Uh, you cannot ignore it Uh, it ain't gonna go away if you got sugar diabetes uh, you can sit there and stare at the wall ain't got it ain't got it ain't got it ain't got it Uh, all you want to but there's a difference between that and living in denial and simply saying God uh, I trust you whether I got sugar diabetes uh, or whether I live or whether I die my faith will be in you it doesn't matter what the doctor said Uh, if I die I'll go out of here giving you praise anyway 
I know I'm not living forever anyhow. I choose to love you. I choose to serve you. I choose to brag on your name. I choose to have faith. Thousands may watch. The crowd may look on. And everybody may spectate. And what what is she going to do? What is he going to do? What are they going to do? I'll tell you, I'm going to do just like the man of God did when he said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I got my faith where it belongs. I got my confidence in a God that ain't never failed. I got my faith in a Lord and a Savior that's been there before. Is anybody this morning can say, I love that God. He's been there in the thick and thin. He was there when mamas and daddies forsook me. He was there when counselors didn't have an answer. He was there when doctors didn't know the solution. And he'll be there today. Can you say man? Somebody give God praise this morning. Come on, worship him this morning. Amen. Amen. Verse number 17 and verse number 18. I want you to look that there is a contrast between two possible outcomes in this story. In verse number 17, their perspective and attitude is if God does choose to deliver us. In verse 18, their attitude is if God does not choose to deliver us. Is there anybody besides me? You believe you have faith, but you also live in a reality because you and I, the longer that you serve the Lord, you will come to understand. There are times that God chooses to answer And there are times that God may be silent and you may end up having a pacemaker put in. And you said, God, I really wanted you to heal me, but I'm going to love you, pacemaker or not. Come on now. And so the three come out. I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. So the three Hebrew boys said in verse 17, our attitude in verse 17 is this. I believe that he can. I know that he will if it be his desire. But in verse number 18, they were real with it. In front of thousands of people watching on and they let them know if God doesn't choose to deliver us, it'll be all right. In verse 17, it said, if be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. You know what they were saying? He's capable. Is there anybody here this morning say, he's capable. Come on, he's capable. He is able, more than capable to do it. But listen to verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You see, we know that there are times that he may, times that he may not. But I like what they said. And this is what settled down in my spirit. And the Lord wanted me to preach about this morning uh, is the fact that they said these few words words be it known unto thee what in the world does that mean preacher well if I put it in everyday English just for the record amen be it known unto thee why was it so important that they were with they went on record before thousands of people what they were saying is you're not going to convince me come on now have you ever had anybody that wanted to argue about something and it's almost like an hour later they're going to find some way they're going to convince you of what they're trying to say. Am I right, somebody? Somehow before it's over they're going to find a way to convince you. But the good news is this, uh, that in the very beginning when a man or a woman of God has made up their mind, they can look flat-footed at somebody and say, just be it known to you. For the record, I ain't changing my mind. I don't care what you say. I don't care how hot the fire is. I don't care how you put it. I don't care what you come up with. 
or what persuasive or convincing type of terminology you might make up, but it doesn't make no difference. I heard you declare heated up seven times hotter. I saw what happened to the men that got close to the mouth of the thing. I already know all of that. I know what I'm up against. I know how bad that it might get. I know that I might die today. I know that that's a possibility, but let us just go ahead and seal the deal right here. Just go ahead and get it on record. We will not bow. Be it known unto thee. We are not going to cave. I'll tell you as a pastor, I've had times that I felt like the devil was doing everything he could to oust me, to get me out, to to get me out of doing what God called me to do. But I've made a a proclamation with my everyday life. Uh, Amen, you tried so many different things, but I'm still here. Is there any Job's uh, that have scraped their boils uh, with a pot shirt and sat in a pile of ashes uh, and said, be it known unto you. You can throw anything you want to, amen, but I'll go down to my dying day trusting God. Uh, You can come up with any kind of crazy mess. Uh, You can put a hot trial in my life. Uh, You can afflict my mind. Uh, You can afflict my body, Uh, but there's one thing about it. Uh, When the dust settles and the smoke clears, uh, I ain't worshiping your God, uh, and I ain't turning back on the Lord. You see, you and I know that in fact God did deliver them. And I believe this morning with all of my heart that it was their firm resolution that caused God to hear their plea and listen and deliver them from their circumstances. Somebody say amen. You see, whenever their confirmation came and their resolute answer was, be it known unto thee, You see, the enemy knew right then and there. They're committed. They're committed. They're going to go all the way to the furnace. They're committed. God knew they were committed. I want to share a little something with you this morning. Hadn't preached this in years. But I remember many years ago preaching a message about commitment. And I came across something that I like real well, and it kind of explains to a degree what it's like to be committed as a child of God. They say that in the airplane uh, world of airplanes where that they fly and get up in the sky off the runway and such as that, that when an airplane is on the runway, they got so many feet. I wish I could remember all the details, but you, you folks are simple enough. You understand. They had so many feet to get that plane up in the air and out up into the sky. Once they got so far, you got a man in the pilot in that airplane, and he's communicating with the man back at the tower. Once that plane gets to a certain point and it lifts off and they get to a certain place, he says, back to the radio tower, committed. In other words, we're off the ground now, and there's no turning back. That's commitment. I've already gone too far. Huh? If I die trying, I've already gone too far. You know, when I read this, what bothered me is that I have seen with my eyes people in the faith that waver here, they waver there. But the Bible said in Hebrews 10 and 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. Come on, you might as well admit it. There's probably been times in your own life whether you might have even realized it or not. You wanted to believe God was going to do it, but then you wake up the next day and you don't feel so good and you think, maybe that tumor's grown. Uh, maybe that cancer has respread. I want to believe that God, come, I'm, I'm out preaching somebody. You want to believe that it'll never come back. You want to believe in the goodness and you want to believe in the promises, uh, but there are times uh, that there's an attack on your faith, uh, an attack on your mind. Uh, do you know this right here ain't a playground. This is a battleground and the devil whips a lot of people right here. Come on somebody. He gets a lot of people to drop out of the race because they've wavered in the faith. One day they're going to serve the Lord and the next day 
well, God can't bring me through this. And maybe God doesn't love me anymore. Let me explain to somebody this morning, and you hear this preacher very well. You see, every time that you go through a trial of affliction, it's not because God, like a puppeteer up in heaven, is trying to make your life miserable. Sometimes God allows things to come your way to try your faith. But when it's all said and done, what you are going through right now is going to become a testimony of your resilience and your tenacity. If God can keep you, Sister Meyer said it this morning, if God can keep Sister Jackson for all these years, he can keep me. If you don't know much about an instrument, the ability for this instrument to hold itself in tune, its tenacity, its ability from the bridge all the way to the neck. Sometimes the neck will get warped, the front, the top will get warped, and it loses its ability, and you're constantly having to tune it. Thank God the Lord blessed me with this guitar, and it rarely ever gets out of tune when it does. It's usually because somebody's monkeying around with it. That's a whole other message in itself. But you see, it's able to hold its tune. It has a tenacity about it. It has a resilience about it. And I don't know, but as a child of God, I'd like to be able to have the kind of resilience that when I'm laying in the hospital and it doesn't make sense uh, whenever I don't when I look at my circumstances and I say God it doesn't make sense but it's all right anyway because if I go in that furnace fire there'll be a son of God in that fire who's likened unto the son of God and he'll bring me through it he'll bring me in and out of it whatever he chooses uh, he'll be there when I I'm in trouble. I can count on him, Brother Steve. It, all, it don't always make sense. But be it known unto thee, whenever your marriage is on the rocks and you feel like everything is going to fall apart and the next step may be calling a divorce attorney and you just stand up and declare, be it known unto thee, devil. I don't care if you go, if you get in my husband's head and get him talking crazy. I still ain't going to stop serving the Lord. If he takes me all the way to divorce court and he's too lazy to get up and go to work, he ain't going to stop me from serving the Lord. He, ain't, he won't pay his tithe. That's all right. Yeah, that ain't going to keep me from serving the Lord. I gave my children to the Lord years ago, but Lord, I don't understand why that they won't give their heart to the Lord, but that ain't going to stop me. Come on, somebody. I'm going to keep on chugging right along uh, because one day my hope, my prayer is, is that when they get tired of the world, when they get tired of circumstance, when they get tired of being beat down by the world and broken down, and they get tired of the hangover and the hangups, uh, that they'll find a Savior who hung on a cross for their redemption and they can find a grandmama or a daddy or a church that hung on during the trial and didn't give up. I've watched wives that were praying that God would save their husbands and years went by and he didn't get saved and after a while they lost faith and hope and they fell out. But I've seen I've seen some great women of God in my time with, a, with an incredible resilience. And boy, if you, really, if you ever went home with them and you've seen what they went through, a lot of times you see people in church, you shake their hand, you ain't got no idea what they go through. You have no idea the mess they deal with on a day-to-day basis. The stuff their families have put them through. All They ought to be in a mental ward somewhere if it wasn't for the grace of God. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. But in the midst of it, they hung on. And they had resilience. They didn't understand a lot of stuff. And at times they even got down on their self because they felt like maybe they didn't handle situation and frustration with their family too well. I hope I didn't come across too that frustrated with them because I'm just at my wits end and I've took so much. Let me tell you, 
There's a time when the Lord deals with you and shows you that you may need to get down and pray and have a little more compassion in your speech. But at the end of the day, sister and brother, let me tell you something. You can't sit around and beat yourself to death and blame yourself because he don't want to serve the Lord. She don't want to serve the Lord. They don't want to serve the Lord. Everybody's got a choice. On that day with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there were thousands of people there that day, but three people showed the entire world that if you'll stand up for God, he'll stand up for you. Do you know when it was all over with, uh, they made such a powerful statement that day that the Nebuchadnezzar himself said anybody that comes against their God, they're going to be put to death because their God is the God. Let me tell you, I'd like to be able to say, because let me tell you, folk, there may be people that mock, ridicule, make fun of our, our God. Well, they don't need our God, but there will come a day whenever they get sick. there will come a day whenever they're broke, their marriage is falling apart and I hope to goodness when they do that they'll have a church somewhere be it Grace Street Church of God or anybody else and a preacher and a family that'll be there and say look we're praying for you we're there with you we'll help you carry the burden together to love you through what you're going through is anybody besides me he says Lord I gotta admit there have been times that I have in fact wavered a little bit there have been, now let's be real. There have been times, preacher, that I've talked crazy. Come on, some stuff you say at home that you don't say at church because it don't sound spiritual. When you say things like, I wish God would just take me on out of here. If I didn't know I'd die and go to hell, I'd pull the trigger myself. Come on, you don't say stuff like that in church because that just does not sound very spiritual. I'm a realistic preacher now. I'm, t- I'm telling you, I have dealt with, I've talked with a lot of people, been through a lot of things, and you get so broken down, and you're driving down the road, and you're all by yourself, and the tears are running down your face, and you say, I don't know how to fix this. There are some of you maybe going through something right now, and you say, I don't know how to fix this. I remember many years ago, I had a preacher friend of mine, and he was working on a car. He said, I ain't never worked on a transmission before. Ain't much of a mechanic. He said, but I can't afford to pay a transmission mechanic. He said, so I crawled up underneath that car. I fiddled and I fumbled and I got the transmission out. He said, I thought to myself, Lord, I got no idea what in the world I'm even doing. He said, he took that transmission apart and he kept praying the whole time. God, I need the answer. You're a great God. You have the answer. I just need you to give me the answer. Listen, when you start calling people, I don't know why I'm preaching this. Somebody needs to hear this. When you start calling every Jim, Bob, Jed, and Fred, and Susie Q on the phone, asking them what they think about it. What do you think I ought to do? What do you think I should do about this situation? How do you think I ought to respond? Do you think I should stay with him? Do you think I should leave him? Do you think I should have the surgery? Do you think I should whatever? Let me tell you, it's all right to get good counsel but I found out a long time ago if they don't go home with you every day if they don't live with your circumstance if they don't know the thoughts in your mind from 24 hours a day 7 days a week they can't give you the right advice unless they've tapped into God and sometimes people give you good what they think's good advice but it turns out it ain't good advice at all what are you saying pastor where the real answer is it's in the Lord. And you say, I've been trying to get pastor's attention. I don't know why I'm preaching this other than the fact my head is really disoriented this morning. And, and in the midst of all this disoriented stuff, the Spirit of God is right here. Praise God. But I don't understand what I'm going through, God. And I've been trying to get Pastor Meyer's attention. But I know Pastor Meyer's been going through a lot. I don't want to really bother him. But I really need to talk to Brother Myers. You are in this service. That's you. God's talking to somebody. And you know what the Lord wants me to tell you? You got the same God that Pastor Myers has got. And if you really want an answer, just go straight to the throne. You don't need beads. You don't have to sit in a booth. Come on now. You can go straight to the throne yourself. You got direct access to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Pastor Myers, 
I've been needing to talk to you and your wife. We need counseling. We need this. We need that. Let me tell you, all that has its place. But sometimes God makes things turn out the way he does because he's tired of you depending on everybody else. Tired of you going to every man and woman and whoever. Sometimes God says, go back to my word and get down on your knees. I've got the answer. You've wavered. You've been like the waves of the sea. You're like Joseph's son when he said he's as un stable as water. One day he thinks he's going that way. The next day I'm doing another thing. Let me tell somebody this morning, I serve a God that loves you so much. Amen. Get a hold of this. He wants to give you the help. He wants to give you the answer more than you want it. I'm going to tell you it's hard to believe that whenever you're really going through the midst of it. And I found out, Brother Farmer, that sometimes God will allow things to come into our lives to cause us to be more merciful, more compassionate, and more understanding. When I had my gallbladder surgery, ended up having complications from the surgery, and I laid in the hospital, and the doctor, I looked at him, I said, it's not good. And When you got a person that actually did the surgery on you, and they look at you, and they don't look real hopeful, that don't make you feel good. I don't care who you are. And, uh, well, we got a pocket of fluid in there. We don't know what it is. And so I got mystery fluid in me. Huh? We don't know. He don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. They got eight bags of antibiotic hanging from a thing. Eight bags. Man, it's almost, we're going to throw everything against the wall. Something got to stick. Huh? One of them got to help you. Something. But at the end of the day, I laid there in that hospital bed and I have people come out and say, Brother Myers, now I know you already know this, but you've got to have faith now. And I have others chastise me. Now you better start, you better start trusting the Lord. You've got to have more faith. When you're laying in a hospital, I've learned sometimes the things that people say, that the way they go about it, let's just be real. Sometimes it can get on your nerves. Huh? And it ain't because they're not good people that they don't mean well, but sometimes you'll be sitting there smiling in the back of your head going, go on somewhere with that. Huh? Where was you 25 minutes ago when that doctor looked like I about at the point of death? Where was you at? Come on now. But you see, what I found is uh, it's easy to tell people what to do. It's easy to tell somebody how to trust God. But when you get down in the valley of trouble and you got everybody watching your life, uh, you understand and you come out of that thing with more compassion when somebody else is going through it. If I didn't learn anything else, I got a lot more mercy when I walk into a hospital room and somebody's going through it. They may be in a place uh, they can't even pray for themselves. And you're here this morning and God sent you here for a reason for the Lord to tell you. You've been going through a place of your life uh, and you say, God, uh, I can't even pray for myself. Uh, I used to really get a hold of God. Uh, but here lately, I can't even pray for myself. Uh, you know, it's in times like that. God will put you in the right place at the right time to get the right word uh, in the right person. Uh, and God will give you a fresh word. Uh, and God said, look, quit worrying uh, and just trust me hold hold on hold out don't quit come on now oh, pastor I don't know how much more I can take of this as I was preparing for this message this morning mentally I didn't get to sit down I had such a a bad headache this morning I couldn't even hardly think of what I was doing sitting at a computer and so I just put a little bit of stuff here and I said, God, you're going to have to make sense of all this, huh? But as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about what God's put on my heart, I understand there were stories in the Bible. One came back to my mind about the woman, the Shunammite woman. You remember her? The one that the Lord God used the man of God to give her a son. And in the very beginning, she said, now don't give me this son. I'm just going to paraphrase. Don't give me this son. Unless it's, it's, it's a real thing. You know what I mean? I, I, I want him to live. I'm going to have a good, fruitful life. And, but don't give me no son if this ain't a real thing. Don't promise me nothing that you can't hold to. You know what I mean? I don't want to be brokenhearted. It wouldn't have been an uncommon thing for the, back in that day for them to have miscarriages and that kind of thing. Medicine and such, such as that. What is it, dance and what have you. But one day, the Bible tells us that the little boy was out there in the field. Now I've looked back. I told my wife, I said, it could have been meningitis. It could have been anything that came on the little boy. 
The little boy got to cry in my head, my head, my head. The little boy died. They brought the little boy home, possibly laid him on a bed somewhere. I don't really know exactly how they did it. But the first thing that woman did, she didn't accept death. He said, no, no, no. No, 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 no. There's a prophet that made me a promise, and we're going to get a hold of that prophet. We're going to get a hold of that prophet, and we're going to have a talk about this. So he wanted to send his servants. He said, mm, that ain't going to work. You got to come yourself. You, you coming. So the man of God shows up, Brother Farmer. And in her persistence, not wavering, she's going to hold out like the three Hebrew boys did all the way to the heat of the fire. The man of God walks in there. Because of that woman's kindness and her servitude, let me tell you this morning, all of these years you've been serving the Lord, there have been times that I've prayed things like this. You call it crazy if you want to. God, you know that I've tried to be faithful. You know I've tried to preach your word. God, you know I've tried to be good to my, my church and I try to preach the truth, God. Would you just please look upon my life and my sacrifice and see that and heal me, touch me, bless me. You understand? Uh, amen. I believe that that day, because of that woman's kindness, whenever that prophet would pass through town, giving him a place to stay, feeding him and that, it all came full circle that day. And when that prophet walked in, he laid himself across the child. That child sneezed seven times and came back to life. Thank God because somebody said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept this. I refuse to re- believe it. I refuse to accept this in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen, just like the man of God, Nehemiah. Amen, the walls of Jerusalem have been torn down. Their city's broken to pieces. But God gave a good man, amen, a vision. And he put a vision in his heart. Thank God for somebody that's got a vision to rebuild. And he went back to the city. And when he got ready to rebuild the walls, they got a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. And they're rebuilding that wall. And all of a sudden, right in the midst of the rebuilding, here came the kings that showed up and wanted to give him a hard time. Why don't you come down from there? And they were making fun, mocking him, saying if a fox ran up on the wall, hit a breakdown. Uh, they were trying everything they could to get him to quit, just like the three Hebrew boys. But honey, let me tell you, on that day, Nehemiah looked at him and said, hey man, I'm building up this wall and I ain't coming down. I got too much to do. I got too much work in front of me. I got too much on the line and I'm gonna build. Uh, and when it's done. uh, Let a fox run up on it. I don't care. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep building. If it's one little brick today, a pebble tomorrow, 20 feet of wall next week, God said whether it's a lot of progress in your eyes or just a little dinky bit of progress in your eyes, just don't stop moving. Brother Fred, you knew where I was going, didn't you? I seen him finish the sentence for me. Just don't stop moving. Because the moment that you stop and you sit down, start pouting, well, I got the worst circumstances this side of South Apopka. Ain't nobody got a marriage like mine, and ain't nobody understands what I'm going through. When you're really going through it, you usually know you are because you don't think anybody understands you. But even if they do or they don't, I serve a God who does. I serve a God that can look beyond what we're going through and how we're going through it. I'm glad this morning to know that if I want to, I can make a proclamation to the enemy and say, be it known unto you. Now, I see you you over here messing with my family over there. You over here, my finances are all a mess. And I'm looking back over here and it seems like my boss is aggravated and he might, I don't know, he might fire me. I don't know. And the church, we, we hadn't really experienced what we were hoping for last week. And, I mean, all these things I understand what you do, but just, 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 I just want to let you know. For the record, I'm not going to quit. Okay? I just want you to, I'm not going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. 
I'm glad as a pastor that I've had times that I have people in my church. They've told me as a pastor, I don't care if 25 of them get up and leave. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to stay right here with you. We're going to hang in there like a hair in a biscuit, like Brother Clifford used to say. We're going to be right there with you. Amen. I One time I went to Pizza Hut and I see somebody had a hair stuck in a piece of cheese and a piece of sausage. So I guess you can be stuck in there like a piece of hair and a cheese ball and sausage. Come on now. I'm stuck in there and I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going to let some crazy mess blow me down. Amen. I'm going to share this with you and I've got to close. Several years ago when I was just a young preacher, sometimes the simplest things really spoke volumes to me. And I tell you, I, I, I was doing a yard sale and my wife said, well, we need to put some signs out by the road. I said, well, that sounds good to me. So I went and I got me some of them stakes, you know, like they use in road construction, you know, got a little point on the bottom of it. And so what I did, I got the bright idea, Brother Eric, that I'm going to put a stick on this side of the sign and a stick on that side of the sign. I put screws with washers. and You know, whenever you're a man, you do th- you do things, you know what I'm saying, like you're building a shelf out there on the side of the road. And so I put the screws and the washers in the wood and I took my sign out there to the middle of the road and it was right there. Uh, Claremont's really growed up but it was right there in a four lane highway right as that bottom of the hill and so I thought well I'm going to go out and I'm going to put my sign in the middle of the road and this is going to work out just fine. I walked out there brother Steve hammer in hand sign with the two sticks I, I got one stick and I started hammering on that one stick. Boy that one stick going in the ground good. I took the other stick got my sign stretched out because you know you got to get the sign tight I started hitting the other stick it went down about three inches and then it wouldn't go no further. Mm-hmm. So I got aggravated, and jerked the other side up, and stuck it in another spot. Drive that one side down. I start trying to drive the other side down. It don't want to go in the dirt. Well, finally, after about 10 minutes of doing that, I'm looking at it. I grab the top of the sign. I do like that. And well, the one leg, this one post on the one side, the sign's crooked. And, but it's there, you know what I mean? I can't get it to go no farther. I ain't going to stand out in the middle of the road all day long, so it's there, you know what I mean? It's about six inches in the dirt. It ought to be fine. It got one stick on this side. So I went back to the house. A little while later, we're looking around. My wife said, well, we ain't got no customers. I said, what, did you put a sign out? I said, yeah, I put a sign. I walked outside the house and looked at a sign laying over on the side of, in, in the median, flat. And them semi trucks going 80 mile an hour and all that stuff. And, it, and I, you know, as a young preacher, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's about the way some people's life is. Amen. Some will be down, dug down deep. It doesn't make no difference. What 18 wheeler come by ain't going to get them out of there. Then there's others. They're satisfied with just being pegged down a little bit because we ran into something and we said, well, we'll just quit right there. Let me tell you that. You can't quit just because you ran into something. You may have to pull that sign up five times and replant it. Come on, you might have put up ten times and redig it, rehammer it. But somehow, some way, you gotta be persistent and you gotta keep going. You can't stop. Stand your feet all across the house before I preach another hour. Come on now. But I feel the presence of the Lord in this house this morning. The farmer's gonna come and play a little some music this morning. I want you to understand this morning. If any of you understood that the way I feel this morning, you would understand just how much God is really trying to help you and help me. I'll put it this way. It doesn't make no difference what storm comes, what storm blows, how the enemy comes against you. If you got your mind made up and you're anchored in a rock, it doesn't matter how the devil puts it. You just got to make a firm resolution right here, right now, This thing might get worse. It might get better. No matter what happens, I'm anchored in you. I'm not going to quit on you, God. I'm not going to quit on you, God. For the record, be it known in front of thousands of people. But whenever it was all over with, it was either going to turn into a disaster or it was going to turn into one of the greatest things anybody had ever seen. And it turned out it was one of the greatest things that that nation, that, that country had ever seen. And there's no telling how many people whose life was influenced by what they saw on that day. We ain't never seen anything like this. I want to live the kind of life as a child of God that though I go through circumstances, Sister Benefield, hardships and trials, I want my family and friends to see 
no matter what. He never quit. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning, just give you an old-fashioned altar call, an opportunity for you to pray about some of the things that God, I know this without a shadow of doubt, there's no question in my mind as I was preaching this morning that God spoke to a lot of people in this service individually on some things that have been going on in your own personal life. You say, Pastor, I really, 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 really need to have a talk with the Lord right now. Well, here's the moment, here's the hour. This is a time that you come down to the front, you get down on an altar, whether you kneel, you stand, you pray, and you say, I don't care (laughs) what anybody else thinks about this, what anybody else has to say about what I'm going through. I'm going to trust the Lord anyhow. Face the raging 